The use of e-cigarettes is associated with an increased risk of heart attack, heart disease, and stroke. In this episode, we explore a bit further into the global web of anti-vape lies. In terms of heart and lung disease, it's looking about as bad as smoking. The truth is, it's not helping you to quit. We know that at the center are billionaire philanthropists who are using their money to influence the World Health Organization, and in turn, governments who rely on their guidance regarding tobacco control policy. But there is another branch to the web, a strategy to corrupt the public and academic narratives who allow themselves to be used to promote the idea that all things tobacco harm reduction are bad and must be discredited. The U.S. Surgeon General is declaring youth vaping an epidemic. And this is why now there is a major push for new research. There's no reason to run a risk that can damage your health for the rest of your life until the science is complete. As we look deeper into this, we see that the same people are funding academic institutions for their research and then assisting in this research to be broadcast in mainstream media to control the public perception and promote anti-tobacco harm reduction lies. The truth is, it's not helping you to quit. This now includes publicly defaming consumer advocates. Earlier this year, the British Medical Journal published an article by Glantz and Patanovich that questioned the integrity of grassroots consumer advocates by inferring that they were nothing more than paid tobacco company lobbyists being used to influence government tobacco control policy to favor big tobacco interests. We spoke with one of the advocates who were attacked, Asa Salagupta from ECST Thailand via telephone. Asa, why do you believe that you were a target as a consumer advocate in the BMJ article? Well, actually, uh, my name was mentioned, so it, it just not the belief. Uh, the article said uh, something like uh, tobacco control victory over tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. But instead of uh, speaking about tobacco industry, uh, that article mentioned my name, mentioned ECST, and uh, somehow it implied we work with big tobacco, namely uh, Philip Morris. And with a short paragraph saying there's no evidence linking us to Philip Morris whatsoever. The whole text seems to imply that we are somehow a part of even, you know, a branch of Philip Morris, which we are not. We are consumers. What was your reaction to this attack? Shocked. I, I should say not, not really shocked. I, I was shocked that, you know, they have a cut to, to do this. But in a sense, uh, the two co-authors, we have known for quite some time that they always come up with some misinformation and outright lies. Have you received an apology and was a correction made to the article? Uh, correction, yes. Apology, no. Because it also not, not uh, mentioned not only ECST, but also uh, mentioned other organizations as well, and uh, quite a few, actually. There are some minor changes, yes. Uh, they said that they took down the part that mentioned our link to... Philip Morris, and uh, also they said they will apologize, but I haven't seen any apology or anything. Now, you may ask, what is the big deal? One researcher who was similarly attacked in the same journal for his research on COVID-19 that had nothing to do with tobacco harm reduction was Dr. Konstantinos Farsalinos. When Dr. Farsalinos wrote to the BMJ and other journals that had published the article to ask for a retraction, he was met with crickets. Then he did his own research into who wrote the article and why they would falsely accuse him of a conflict of interest he does not have. Again, an issue of a presumption 
that could have been easily verified by the authors, who chose not to do that. What he found out was that the authors of the article who accused him failed to present their own conflict of interest, specifically their funding from the University of Bath and from the Bloomberg Foundation through the University of Bath. What is most concerning about universities and researchers making ad hominem attacks on consumer advocates and researchers' authenticity and integrity is that A, they are based on presumptions and not facts, and B, advocates under normal circumstances would not even be aware of the attacks and therefore would not have an avenue for response. Let's get some guidance from Jerry Stimson, Director of Knowledge Action Change in the United Kingdom, about the attacks on consumers, advocates, and all things tobacco harm reduction in a scientific medical journal. Why do you believe that some advocates are being attacked in scientific journals? I think this is a pathetic last-ditch attempt to try to uh, delay or defer tobacco um, harm reduction. They've, lo they've lost the arguments. There's not the science to support their arguments. So all they can now do is to resort to ad hominem attacks, whether it's on uh, consumer, consumer groups, scientists or advocates uh, and of course it's it's well funded and there's going to be a lot more of it to come it's well funded by bloomberg and uh, it's well funded at the university of bath and some other organizations so there, there's going to be more along the way what is your advice to consumer advocates who find themselves being attacked in the media and in scientific journals Okay, first, it's outrageous that individuals can be named in a scientific paper in tobacco control or BMJ. It seems to be totally out of order that you can pick on uh, ordinary citizens, you know, and, and talk about their, their work as though they are research subjects and they don't have any say in being involved in that. Um, I, I, I think there's lots of ways you can try to knock back. Um, you know, there may be legal challenge and sooner or later somebody in tobacco control is going to go that one step too far that, the, you know, somebody can sue them. But in the meantime, I think don't moan, complain. And that's my new tack this year. Whenever you see something that's wrong, whether it's a researcher who's using deception to gain information about vapors, whether it's people who are looking at you know, accusing ECST of being in league with PMI, um, with it, then you complain to journals, you complain to ethics committees, you complain, complain to universities. A lot of this stuff is on the margin of what's legitimate in science. So I think you, you have to make a noise and make life difficult for the people who are making life di difficult for you. So where does this leave us? We know that those who should be held to a higher professional standard can be bought and sold. We know that we should have the right to respond when we are being attacked in the media and scientific journals. Stay tuned as we discuss in the live panel that follows a strategy and approach in order to deal with these attacks in the media and scientific journals. But first, don't forget to sign and share the Right to Switch petition.